Hey guys, welcome back, it's Ripe again in today's video. A homeowner association sued me for over $120,000 because my house is painted in the wrong color. They forced me to join the HOA, but I persisted and they failed. When I came home one day, they vandalized my property. Here is what happened. As a single man approaching his late 30s, people often think I must be a successful entrepreneur or lottery winner when I tell them I have my own house in the suburbs without a mortgage, but in truth I have only my family to thank for this life. When my father died 10 years ago, it left a hole in our family, which took a long time to heal, but with his passing came inheritance and being an only child I was given his old house. I did my best to take care of it in his absence, but one thing I never changed was the pain. His favorite colors were blue and silver and everyone else knew this because he had the house painted in those colors. This however ended up putting a target on my back for later when the HOA came knocking. A few weeks after the funeral I was moving in my things when the HOA manager introduced herself in a manner that outwardly appeared to be a good neighbor's way of welcoming me to the area. On the other hand, when I explained that my father had passed, the lady seemed to be happy at the news, which I found incredibly rude and off-putting, although she made no mention of why at the time. The next day I was out weeding the yard when she happened to pop by again, this time with a small entourage of handymen armed with paint cans and rollers. In a very sharp and direct manner, the lady explained that all houses managed by the HOA must follow their code of rules, one of them being that every house other than mine was painted in the same marble white and slate grey style. My house being the only one not to conform made me stand out and apparently ruining their perfect neighborhood. But just as my grandmother before me, I was not the type of person that was happy being bossed around or falling into line. All for the sake of being the same as everyone else, same white fence, same mailbox, same red brick walls, same everything. I had studied my deeds and rights very carefully when I moved in and this house being older than the HOA itself meant that we were not subject to its rules or regulations. The HOA lady was furious at my reluctance to follow orders and stormed away with her troops. Not the best start to my new life I thought, but it was what my grandmother would have wanted. It was not until a week later that trouble returned to the house. On a weekend of gorgeous summer heat I held an open barbecue event in the yard, giving me an excellent chance to meet my new neighbors. Moods were as bright as the weather all until the HOA crashed the party. I did not even realize she was here until I heard her across the yard openly and insulting the colors of the house as tacky and vile to a crowd of quiet nodding. When I joined the conversation the lady even tried to pressure me into changing the colors by encouraging the neighbors to turn against me, though they looked about as lost in the situation as I did. I reiterated that I was free from the HOA rule, which earned some smirks from the growing crowd, though she was less than impressed. The next morning I got a brochure through my door on the benefits of the HOA as well as other forms of blatant propaganda that could only be from her. As I carried the papers over to the trash can, a form fell out of the pile. I chucked the rest as I went to pick it up. It was an application form to join the HOA, which had already been mostly filled in, just missing my final signature. Talk about persistence. I ripped it up and added it to the rest of the trash. I guess she took my words to heart the last time we spoke. If she managed to trick me into joining the HOA, then I wouldn't be able to resist her domination anymore. I got a few more suspicious deliveries before she gave up on the idea. As October was coming up, I was preparing for a holiday with friends that was now a year in the making. I thought I may have to cancel it with doubts that my house would be safe in my absence, but my kind neighbors assured me they would keep a keen eye over my things until I returned. Somehow this news also traveled quickly, spreading throughout the neighborhood like wildfire despite only personally telling those adjacent to me. With little else to be done about it, I packed up my car and headed off to the airport for the first leg in my journey. After getting out of the area, my mind pushed away my worries and started getting excited about the adventures ahead. My house could wait, I needed time to relax now. Two weeks passed by and I soon found myself driving home again, ready to decompress and sleep for the next two days. I found much of the neighborhood unchanged, the same houses with their same washed out appearances. I did not use a set nav because I was comfortable that I remembered my way, but as I got closer I became unsure. Another issue with everything being the same, it was all a confusing labyrinth designed to keep you trapped. I must have passed the same street four times before I stopped to get navigational help. With my destination confirmed, I tried again, only to find a house I didn't recognize. 
The faded and nostalgic colors of my father's old house had been replaced by the same factory setting the other houses were painted in. Not only that, my yard had been utterly destroyed in the process. A small row of bushes under the kitchen window had been ripped out and replaced with stone slabs while a small apple tree I planted in the corner was uprooted and sticking out of my garbage can. I could handle the nagging and the leaflets but actually going behind my back to do this to my home was unacceptable. While there was little I could do to restore the yard without much time and effort, there was at least one thing I could do to put things back to normal. After stopping by a nearby hardware store, I spent the rest of the afternoon and early evening repainting my house. It was too big of a job to do alone in a single night, but I was satisfied enough to leave it half finished overnight. Imagining that it would only add to the HOA's horror when they saw I had changed it. Like clockwork, I soon heard from them again when the HOA lady ran across the street to interrupt my painting the following day. She was furious, outraged and horrified that I would repay her kindness by reverting to the old and ugly colors it was previously. Unlike other days, I was not about to let her be the only one to rage, seeing as how I was the actual victim in this scenario. Cutting her off mid-sentence, I launched into her with a rant of my own as she was left speechless to it. I held nothing back in my accusations and insults, telling her to stay away from my house. She stormed off without a retort, face still pale and lifeless from being shouted at. I knew they were not used to taking no for an answer, but hoped now they saw I was ready to bark back they would rethink their approach. I found I was sadly let down by them again when I received new mail from the HOA, expecting it to be the same old propaganda. To my shock, I found instead that I was being sued for $120,000 for breaking HOA regulations with added fines for harassment and intimidation to HOA staff. It was unbelievable. First they repaid my house for me, then expect me to pay them when I change it back. Just who the hell did they think they are? I, even if I wanted to pay their outrageous fees, it would only bankrupt me to do so, leaving me to sell my house and move away. Just another victory in their books, I guess. The fighting nature in me told me to take a stand even if I was the underdog and this was not a war movie. I met their challenge with one of my own, countersuing them for unlawful alterations to my house and damages caused by emotional abuse and harassment. In the weeks leading up to the first trial, I heard nothing from the HOA lady or their lawyers. They made no attempt to settle so they must have felt confident. In contrast, I heard a lot from the other neighbors though, the word on the grapevine was not in my favor. The HOA had wasted no time in turning public support against me. Luckily for me, my lawyer was also quite confident in our chances, offering me legal counsel pro bono on the strength of the case itself. In the end, we did win, though it was a bit ropey for most of the debate. The HOA got a taste of their own medicine, ordered to pay out $120,000 to me instead. The HOA quickly distanced themselves from the lady I had the fights with, their upper management apologizing to me directly after firing her. While I did not really believe it was only her, they were keen to keep me happy after the trial, giving my house and yard a full restoration to its original glory. And here, ripe stars, it's always good to hear that the HOA crazy busybody Karen got what she deserved. I hope she will never run for an HOA position again. A true dictator. Anyway, the next one is another revenge story. I emigrated from the US to the UK for work, a few other co-workers from the US were also relocated. One of the other Americans that moved with the company had a real issue that I was 15 years his junior and had the same job. He would come to my house while I was not home, be snooping our home uninvited and he would go through my mail. Several times I was told he went through my email regularly as well. He was furious that we got the same company car and office size etc. To give a little perspective on this guy, he had a tattoo of the company slogan done on the back of his neck and seemed to really enjoy reporting any minor issue of his co-workers to management. He was very easy to dislike. And well, I started off small by making sure I got to work before him and taking his parking spot. I know how petty this sounds, but it truly bothered him deeply, but I started to wonder if it was worth the escalating battle of who could get to work first, but given the clear results, I kept it up. I would also send fake emails from my account to bait him, like once I emailed my wife that we were getting a dog. It took him 2.2 seconds to run to our management and advise that we had gotten a dog in a company leased house, which was a violation of policy. That was the fun stuff, once we had a party for the American families for Thanksgiving at his house. 
Before the party, my wife told me he regularly gets drunk and beats his wife. I did not like the guy, but I had no reason to believe this about him until that night. She had clearly been roughed up and there were empty bottles everywhere. Apparently, he had a real anger issue and it manifested itself at work with a local UK employee and then security was called. I thought that was the end for him, but he scraped by. About a month later, a company security guard left a violation notice pad in the lunchroom and I got an idea that worked far beyond my wildest dreams. The next day, I got a few friends to come in very early so we could take the whole front row of parking spots. The other spots were much further away, needless to say, he was beside himself with anger. After about an hour, I went out and put a violation notice on his car for improper parking. When he left for the day and went to his car, I was watching from five floors up. I could see him turn red and explode in anger, he nearly sprinted to the guard shack and proceeded to physically assault the guard on duty, police got involved and this guy now has a violent offense on record. It only took a few days for the company to see his true colors, fire him and send him home. I had heard a few months later that the wife, who was a lovely person, had moved on and was in a much happier relationship. And the next one is another revenge story and it is titled Revenge for Not Paying Rent. So this is a story about what my friend KP did to help his buddy get rid of a roommate who just wouldn't move out. What you have to understand is KP is the sort of guy who will put far more effort into a scam than honest work would ever take. He lives for the flim flam, in grade school he had every puke ray and remote control fart box they sold. We spent our teenage years driving around to fast food restaurants and telling the manager that they got our order wrong in order to wee some free food or disconnecting the odometer on his mom's scooter so we could joyride undetected. KP's family was wealthy, but that didn't matter. His car plates were always counterfeit, he was the guy who would hook up your cable, he ran a side business replicating of age stamps that all the local bars used, he ran a high schooler speakeasy in his spare bedroom, he forged a dealer's license to buy his RV wholesale and to this day, every time he walks into a restaurant, he goes right over to the server's counter and grabs someone else's chicken fingers and brings them to the table. Nobody said these stories had to involve ethical people, he dropped out of college first semester to go to one of those get-rich-quick seminars in Vegas and actually got it rich with one of those legal scams. You know, the bounce check mini lane one, so needless to say, he doesn't have to work and has actually spent his time pursuing one grift or another, from diamond cutting to inventing a new kind of lawnmower. They never go anywhere because his interest dries up quicker than the thousand dollars worth of dead fish in his saltwater aquarium. I would not be surprised if right now he was soaking the labels off of some wine bottles or selling some counterfeit calamari. He lives for the flim flam, but he is also a volunteer firefighter that plays a small role. His buddy, Schlamuzzle, got into a year-long lease for a one-bedroom apartment. Shortly after that, he and his girlfriend got pretty serious and they decided to buy a house. He subletted his apartment to a guy who I will call the guy on our couch, Gooch. And well, Gooch did not have a job and never paid rent, ever. Schlamuzzle begged and pleaded and threatened, but nope, Gooch did not budge. He didn't have a job and rarely left the house, just smoked pot all day and played video games. Schlamuzzle was living with his girlfriend and trying to apply for loans. Unpaid rent would look bad on his credit, he appealed to the landlord to initiate an eviction, but the landlord said, your problem, F you, pay me. A few months went by and he is paying this guy's rent and getting a lot of empty promises and getting nowhere. So then he calls KP. This is the sort of phone call KP lives for, he springs into action. First thing he does is buy one of those pre-made websites that he sets up like a fake exterminator company. He gets them a 1-800 number and routes it to Schlamuzzle's phone. Then he goes to Home Depot and buys Tyvek suits, masks, roach traps and some of those little wand sprayers that exterminators use. He enlists the help of a friend, Mensch. Then he rents a U-Haul, he grabs a toy he has called a Thermal Imaging Camera or TIC that firefighters use to find sources of heat in thick smoke. It looks like a very official piece of equipment, then they suit up and knock on Gucci's door. Annual bug bomb, they say. Gooch comes to the door in a thick haze of smoke, eyes squinty. Huh? Annual bug bomb, they say. Have you lived here a year? They knew he hadn't. Yep, every year we got a bug bomb your place. Here's our card, you can call the office if you want. It helped a little that being a filthy stoner, Gooch did have a roach problem. So he lets them in and they start spraying the corners and scanning the walls with the TIC. Yep, you can see their tracks everywhere. 
You definitely got roaches in here. At this point, Mensch is taking long strips of roach traps and ripping them off the strip and frisbeeing them into the corners. But he's got gloves on and he's having trouble tearing them. Gooch is getting suspicious, these guys are exterminators and this guy cannot tear a roach trap off a strip? In a stroke of genius, Mensch exclaims, ah, I hate when they give me the blue ones, and throws the strip down. They convince Gooch that he must vacate the apartment for 24 hours. Go stay with a friend. Oh, you have a cat? Well, the cat cannot stay. You gotta take it. So, as soon as the coast is clear, the operation begins. They back the U-Haul up to the door and flag down a passing big guy. Hey, you wanna make 50 bucks helping us move? Then they proceed to move all of Gucci's stuff into the U-Haul. A guy like that, what does he have? Some dirty sheets on a futon mattress, a TV, a slab of canned beans and ramen packs. A litter box that hasn't been changed since the Nixon administration. When that's done, Schlemuzzle, who has been manning the phone, sweeps in with a digital camera and takes pictures of the empty apartment. He has scheduled an appointment with a locksmith who arrives and changes the locks. They all head to a storage facility with the U-Haul and unload Gucci's stuff into a locker. Schlemuzzle takes a picture of that too. Schlemuzzle goes to Kinko's and prints out the digital pictures of the empty apartment and the full storage unit along with a sign. Gucci returns to the apartment the next day to find a sign on the door that says Your stuff has all been moved into storage. Meet me at the storage unit at this place and time with your back rent to get your stuff back. On the door is a picture of the empty apartment and a full locker. His keys don't work. At the meeting time, Gooch shows up with the cops. He is called and told them that someone has stolen all of his stuff and is extorting him. KP explains the real situation to the police and says that they may be interested in certain items among Gooch's stuff that resembles heavily used tobacco pipes and hookahs. The cops, realizing exactly what has gone down, shake their heads. They know they cannot prove that the contraband is Gooch's. They say KP cannot extort the back rent this way. Then they issue Gooch a summons for filing a false police report. Schlemuzzle never got his back rent, but he did get his subletter out. And yeah, ripe stars, I gotta say, if I would be a landlord, I would definitely not allow the subletting of apartments. I know some landlords that allow this and I guess for most it's just a case of they don't even know that it is happening. Because honestly, which landlord would be happy with this? I just don't get it. The next one is titled Office Revenge. Do you guys also have this one person in the office that everyone dislikes? Well, I do. He follows rules to the letter and takes joy from being incredibly petty. He rubs everybody the wrong way, his kids are adults now, but he still books off the kids' holidays before anyone else gets the chance, so people who actually have children cannot take it. He complains when some people book a few days off before and after Christmas, as you are meant to do one or the other, but then he will do it himself. Lately, he has really been rubbing me the wrong way. If something of yours is 5mm over the line and onto his desk, he will push it back onto your desk or knock it over. The apprentice had a bottle of water like this the other day and Jobsworth threw it in the bin. We are hot desking and are also supposed to clear all items from desks at the end of the day and not reserve them. This rule is aimed at those who come in twice a week on a rotor, like him, but I come in every day. As I come in every day, I see no harm in being at the same one permanently. My boss sees no issue with this, but the job's worth took it higher and has kicked off in management meetings, etc. So my boss apologized to me and said I have to clear the desk at the end of every day and he will send out a mass email saying so. The job's worth has also complained about people wearing jeans as this is not professional, so this was included in the mass email. Although it said that jeans were smart slash casual and fine to wear as long as there were no rips or anything. So this is where the petty revenge comes in. The Jobsworth likes to wear shorts, he also wears flat peak slash fitted hats and a leopard print face mask. I then clicked reply to all to the email and responded something along the lines of Regarding workplace attire, I assume that flat peaks, leopard masks and shorts are also inappropriate. It does not look very professional to clients and I assume that this was the reason, company name, provided us with our own branded masks, right? And the boss has agreed with me and said only our branded masks or the blue surgical masks can be worn, no shorts and no unsuitable hats. 
Jobsworth has then called the boss in a rage and has demanded that I apologize for this personal attack on him and is apparently kicking off and trying to take it to the union. It's a very small win, but I am loving how angry it has made him. And yeah guys, sometimes petty revenge is all you need to get back at someone and you can certainly make someone's life hell with it. The next one is titled The best revenge is a life well lived. When I was in my younger years, I managed a children's after-school project which was actually pretty fun, except for one issue. We had one kid there who could be problematic and lash out physically at others. One day he did just that to me and I have training regarding restraint procedures. I had to restrain for about 10 seconds, nothing harmful or anything, exactly how we were trained to do it. I informed his stepdad when he came to collect him and explained everything that had happened. Explained the anger and his lashing out and kicking me and showed him the bruises on my legs. The following day I get a visit from the head of the council department I worked for. A complaint has been made. The police have been informed and I've been suspended from all four jobs I worked with the local authority, including childcare and youth work and I had just left the residential social work side of my work. It turns out that this kid's mom had just qualified as a social worker and had started pulling all of the strings that she could with her new colleagues. She tried to get me arrested and charged with assault. That went nowhere as there was no case to answer and the police interviewed me and later informed me that they could not even believe it had been brought to them in the first place. But where it gets crazy is that there was literally a witch hunt started. Lies were told within the council by this woman, backed up by friends in the same department. A sham internal investigation was carried out, the management committee of the after-school project I managed was directly threatened with being blackballed themselves. This included the site manager of the school, a police office and other people who worked with children in some form. They panicked and decided to let me go, but they wrote and told me of the threats made to them. The council's investigation then relied heavily of this dismissal as reason enough to terminate me from all my other roles. What they failed to realize was that I had been collecting everything I could. People I knew within the council passed me copies of emails and I had nearly 8 years service with them and I qualified for legal help to sue them for the dismissal. So that is exactly what I did and they did not even want it to go as far as a tribunal because their case was non-existent and relied on assumptions and unprovable rumors spread by their own staff. Let's just say that I had to sign an NDA and could not talk about it for 10 years and I had a not so insignificant payout. So now comes the petty revenge part, 4 years ago I ran into this kid. Now a full-grown adult in his early 20s, I was stood behind him in the supermarket and he eventually recognized me and started to say something snotty to his friend about me. I leaned forward and said, tell your mom I said thanks, if not the lies and BS she tried to pull, I would have never had, insert large sum of money here, to buy my house with it. It paid 60% of it up front and could not have done it without you guys. I then gave him a wink and smiled. The look on his face was priceless. He literally started to turn purple and his friend kept asking him what lies did you tell to get him that kind of payout? In the end he dumped his shopping basket and stormed off. I moved one place closer to the checkout with the biggest grin on my face you have ever seen. And yeah guys, indeed the best revenge is simply a life well lived. In my opinion that's also one of the most satisfying ways of revenge you can get. And with this we have reached the end of the video, however if you cannot get enough of my content please check out my endless playlist where you can find thousands of hours of content. In addition please don't forget to subscribe to my channel to not miss any of my daily uploads. Thank you so much in advance and I hope to see you again tomorrow.